you almost need to you also need to accept the, the challenges of that yeah we'll sell buttloads of it if there's enough money in the purse then we can do it all oh. So we've been talking about a post by Pascal Borne today, who we all follow, who posts a lot about all the stuff that we're interested in in terms of yeah. software and automation, automation and all, automation. That, all that cool stuff that we love. So he posted recently a, a picture for people that aren't watching. Uh, you've got two people having a conversation and uh, one person is essentially a salesperson selling the dream. You, the other person that opposite is represents the client thinking this sounds amazing. And then you've got a dog under the table. The salesperson's holding the mouth, and the dog's thinking, essentially, how how the hell am I going to deliver what has just been sold? Okay, that's so the technical team, isn't it? That's yeah, that's the technical team thinking, uh, what? How am I going to do this? So, does that ring any bells? Given that I'm sat with two salesmen <clears throat> and I'm playing oh. the role of engineering in this, does that ring any bells, Mister Salesman? I couldn't possibly agree or disagree on that. No, seriously, um, I would say. Three, four years ago, I would suggest there was an element, um, certainly within our organisation and I, you know, the customers that we go out and talk to, some of the things they get told or promised by, you know, competitors, you, you do question how that can be delivered. But certainly in the last couple of years, I don't know if that's got any, you know, synergy to you starting, Steve, but um, the parameters to what we do and how we go about it now, I would say... I'd like to think the vision is within our technical team, certainly, we don't go too far off piste. Yeah. But, uh, you know, when we're chasing a sale, sometimes, you know, you, uh, certainly not to deceive the client, but I think to challenge the the engineering or technical team. Yeah. Um, but I certainly think Push there's the boundaries. a... boundaries. Yeah. But I, I certainly think there's a, a much more consultative, um, collaborative mm. approach now um, and then reluctantly, sometimes if we're advised we can't do it, you, you go back and you know not do it. But we've got a, a much better structure in place now, haven't we, as to how we understand the client's requirements, how we advise what our solutions can do, um, and then what we can deliver. So I would say three, four years ago, definitely selling the dream and wanting to deliver that dream, understanding, because in our heads, as salespeople, it makes sense. It's logical. Why can't, yeah. you know, of course it can do that. <clears throat> yep. And then as long as you keep the you know the technical people away long enough to get the deal, then it's like, well, over to you. Mm. That was certainly three, four years ago. Okay, uh, good response. Well done. Thank Neil, you. your next thing stand. The, I suppose in, in the past we've had, so the way we generally work is obviously from a salesman perspective, my main thing is obviously um, to introduce and find these customers that are interested in, in automation and digitization. And then we bring in a business process consultant. So a lot of the time I'm looking at it from a commercial perspective, trying to build a business case, trying to understand the problems. Um, and then I rely heavily on the business process guys to kind of steer me in a direction of what is possible and what isn't possible. And you learn that over time. And we have had consultants in the past that, yeah, the answer was always yes. It's like, how big is your budget? Mm -hmm. And I think with technology, that can be the case. Yeah, I agree. Again, anything's achievable depending on <laughs> your time frames. How long do you want? Do you want yeah. something off the shelf, or do you want something bespokenly made? I think it's worth pointing out that what we do as a business, we're resellers, not developers. So we're configuring um, our suppliers' software, and I think that does limit what we can offer to a certain degree. But that being said, a lot of the time when our suppliers bring out new solutions or upgrades to our solutions they i guess present it to us first and then we have to obviously go out there and, and and sell it to our customers and what i generally find is there's a bit of a two-step process to that so the suppliers i won't name names but the suppliers might over egg what their solution can do oh mm -hmm. it can do this that and the other get all the salesman the oh yeah all out the box it's yeah. real easy you should be able to go speak to your customers and yeah we'll sell buttloads of it and again gets the salesman interest you've got to get engagement from us because again mm -hmm. if it ain't going to make us money we're not going to spend time on it or if it ain't going to help our customers we're not going to we're not, not going to re recommend it i guess and especially when it's a new product launched 
I always have air on the side of caution and I make sure that one of our technical guys like Josh or Rich at least have had a look at it. But you're right, I think reverting back to that original sort of consultant, the answer is always yes, depends on how big your budget is. And it's finding where that's part of that consultative process that you talked about, John, in terms of how much do you want to spend? How big yeah. a problem is it? And how quick do you want it? And then trying to find the that, right That's thing. the challenge, isn't it? Because there's um, Tony Grimes, who's the director of Think360, a sister company, a group within the, a company within the family. He always says that the answer is always yes. Because it is generally with software development, within reason. Yeah. But it's a question of how much money do you want to spend? And, and at what the point? Problem. Yeah, at what point <laughs> do you get to diminishing returns? If it's going to cost you 20 grand, is it a 20 grand problem? And those are the those are the conversations that we need to have with clients. Uh, I, uh, and interesting that that last couple of words you just said there, Steve. So recently, some of the projects that um, you know I've, I've won and following our you know much more robust sort of process with sales and technical working mm. much closely together. So I've been on a couple of scoping um, uh, meetings, and and actually. Our BPCs have been very much along the lines of, right, tell me absolutely everything you do and we take it all down granularly. Um, and then it's like, right, okay, uh, how important is that to you? Yeah. Well, it, it's a nice to have. And if it could have it, if we could have it, it'd be brilliant. All right. But if it took 40% of your purse, would you do it? Mm -hmm. um, well, probably not because it's not that big of a problem. And, and I think that's where we're... Um, becoming more efficient and more um, uh, transparent with the client is around the whole um, understanding, you know, the, the, the whole how important is each element to, to your workflows or to your process and then tailoring what where we spend the, the purse of time. As you rightly said, Neil, if there's enough money in the purse and there's enough budget even as a, you know, um, a contingency, then we can do it all. Mm. And, but, and there's a, there's a, there's a, um, I suppose a common trait is to try and, I suppose people please, and if a customer wants it, we try and, yep, no, no problem, Mr. Customer, we can, we can help you. But part of my role and what I try and do is quantify something and also make sure we don't over engineer something. And I use the, you know, like sledgehammer to crack a nut. Like, mm. do we really need that? Is, is that, does it really need digitizing or in that situation like i've said before is paper still the best modality to move that information around the business because again not every single process needs to be automated if it's going to slow it down mm -hmm. do you know what i mean but yeah. the perception in the customer's head is oh well that must be able to do that and sometimes if you allow the i guess the developer to speak directly to the customer and he's very much a blue sort of people pleaser, but very technical and wants to make it work. Yeah, brilliant. They'll consume loads of time making it work and they're trying to test it. And I'm saying, well, yeah, who's paying for this? <laughs> and then it's making yeah, having... It's our, our job as, a, <coughs> as being a good business advisor, isn't it? To yeah. say, yeah. well, really, we'd love to charge you 10 grand for this, but actually you know, let's understand if it's a 10 grand problem. And if it isn't, then let's not do it because we yeah. no point you paying for it. I think that's that's a that's a good conversation, a good grown up conversation to have with clients, which I think we're doing more and more. And don't get me wrong, I mean, we've had people in here before. I remember we we employed um, a person that was previously, um, I suppose, a new business development uh, manager, but he'd come from a a very much a software development background where they were literally developing it from scratch, and he was mm -hmm. going in charging hundred grand plus for these type of projects, and nearly anything was possible so i was mm. thinking how do you sell that because you're going in you're asking what what type of problems they're trying to solve and he's like nodding saying yes and and then he's like like you say in that picture it's like the engineers sat there thinking how, how are we going to deliver this and it's and then it's a case of time scales it's like mm. okay well with our current workload with our current resources and team and technology do we have to go to market and actually or are we actually going to be building this ourselves or and, and some of sorry go on. sorry uh, I, I think there's a couple of things for me that we've started to sort of evolve to do and and bringing that image back into it around sort of taking the hand off the muzzle of the dog and letting letting the the dog have more of a of a say is um, and, and I think it, there's an education also for clients is actually 
you mentioned a minute ago, Steve, about you know having those business conversations, and and actually we bring a lot of value to a, an organisation without even putting any software in place at the start. Yeah. So a prepaid or a pre-project paid scope will come in. Will be you know a consultancy. Yeah. We'll, we'll understand your processes in a particular department or area that you want to look at, and we'll come back and we'll say right here's what you currently do here's how you could automate it in various steps or, or you know iterations if you like what do you want to do but ultimately at the end of it if they decide they don't want to do anything that's fine yeah. but actually they've now got a much more clearer understanding because i'm amazed at how many department leaders fds you know um, mds who don't they think they know what's going on in finance they think they know what's going on in sales or, or whatever yeah. wherever there's um, um, you know, sort of manual paper processes, if you like, you know. Yeah. Um, and actually, when you get someone, a third party to come in and capture that, and you do see it a lot in huge, you know, multinational organizations, they spend an awful lot of money on external consultancy yep. to come in and say, right, this is how you're doing it and this is how you should be doing it or could be doing it. Yeah. But in the sort of area, the SME market, you know, up to half a billion. I don't think you see much of that. No, no you're it's right. always chicken and egg. That's the thing in terms of when you're selling a deal, you're often selling it before you've got into the detail of the scope of the project. Yeah. And therefore, there's always a risk that new information, well, it will, because you've not scoped it yet. New information will come out as you scope that project. And, and that's where... It's difficult for you as a sales guy because you're selling something, but you're not you're not understanding the intricacies at this point of what you're selling. Yeah, there's something called the, the cone of uncertainty, which if um, people are watching, they can they can hopefully back will flash it up on screen again, or you can Google it. But it kind of talks about as you go through the software development cycle, the level of uncertainty decreases. But it's uh, and pre scope, it's it's absolutely huge. Even after the scope, it's mm. still. There's still uncertainties because it's only when you start building that new information comes out, when you start showing the client the solution, then they say, oh, it'd be good if it did X, Y, and Z. Again, new information comes out, and it's it's difficult to to manage software for that reason. Yeah. It's, I suppose touching on your process mapping and things, I think now with the technology that's out there, you mentioned obviously bigger companies, yeah, process mining is a, is a, is a thing and process optimization and, and the fact that, you can we can collaborate on two sets, can't we? We can obviously got the consultants that can look at paper processes, and then we've got technology that can sit on a server, mm -hmm. map out True. the processes, and actually quantify that, and then report back in real time where your bottlenecks are, and then obviously go after those ones that are causing um, too much delay, yeah, delay and value. But I saw a bit of a shift. Did a webinar yesterday morning, and from a I suppose a, a software developer perspective it's that shift to this sort of marketplace and these certified skills that you can get download and things like that so i know one of our vendors is, is going down that route and especially when it's intelligent automation and, and looking at it from a document processing angle they're trying to put this marketplace out there so that speed to value if you can have i don't know whether it be delivery notes whether it be bills of lading whether it be invoices sales orders they're putting certified skills out there that are pre-trained that again you can drag and drop and it's that, that whole shift to sort of no code low code so again instead of having to have a developer mm -hmm. literally develop it from scratch it's like let's have a platform let's have something that you can pick and choose and, and build still a tailored solution but and we've always found that i think with us um been a reseller we've always looked at best of breed and try to pick and choose maybe a core three or four solutions that give people the end-to-end -end from a capture management and reporting and side of things but i think these these marketplaces do allow the technical guys to i guess it's, it's like their intellectual property if you like they've, they've created a skill they can get it certified get it published on the on on this marketplace and then other companies and, and again it kind of links in with your license and you just pay on a page count per so basis it's, so, so it's a configurable it's, solution but a, but made up of off-the-shelf products yeah and, and it's quite can, interesting again. perspective from a salesman perspective you're selling the the platform as a look mr customer here's what you get as part of the package and it's ever evolving because you've got this <coughs> um kind of open source 
network of people, clever people creating these skills and publishing them up there. So mm -hmm. if you do have issues with um, like bills of lading or delivery notes or something that's within your process that you've identified as a bottleneck, actually check the marketplace first. Actually, yeah, there's a skill. And it might be that you need people like ourselves to help configure it and make sure, test it and do that side of things. But it's it's speeding up that speed to value. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, well, one of the things I was going to play devil's advocate on your side for a second actually was innovation comes from pushing the boundaries. And it's, it's I think it's easy to stay within your lane and let's just churn out accounts payable solutions. But actually, businesses need to innovate. We need to innovate. And the way that we do that is saying actually, can we help a client with this problem? Even if we don't necessarily know the answer initially, we can challenge the guys downstairs to come up with an answer. And they're, they're bright kids, you know, they, they they can, and they often do, and that's where we then innovate and change our proposition. Yeah, absolutely, and and I think that's how we've evolved over the last, you know, five, 10 years in, in this space is we've taken on challenges, and probably to start with, we probably took on challenges that, that we didn't, we didn't have any experience in mm -hmm. and we kind of took a bit of a leap of faith and you know in some cases got our our fingers burnt but in others we've we've learned and managed to evolve our offering I, I suppose one point for me though is going back to that image <clears throat> the customer and inverted commas being sold a dream and thinking that's amazing mm. that there is for me there is an element of responsibility that the, the customer has to be realistic as well mm. and not go oh that's a moon or a stick fantastic you know when can you start there there has to be an element of well actually do you know what i appreciate that's really complex and i bring it up simply because we often, and, and in culture and in what we do and everything we do, there's normally a fixed price. Mm. So you mentioned very you know, uh, much earlier on around, you know, well, actually it evolves and thereby the amount of time required evolves and thereby the cost evolves. Loads of customers aren't comfortable it's with that. It's a difficult concept. It's a difficult yeah. concept for them to appreciate. And uh, being truthful, we've had many a conversation where I'm like, I can't do that, Steve. I can't mm. go back and say this, that, and the other. And and actually, rationally, it should be quite straightforward. And from your side, you're like, well, why not, JV? Mm. Well, you know, really, it is what's changed, and that's the. And I get that, but equally, I I think sometimes, and I don't always think it's the the fault of the salesperson that as you know, I think you you get a customer where you, as Neil said early on, you you understand their requirements. And you say, yeah, in principle that, but we'd need to know more, going back to the whole um, advantage of prepaid scopes. Yeah. And then what you get is, in their mind, they've got all sorts of avenues that open up, and it's like, brilliant, it can do this, this, this. Mm. And they suddenly go from where we're thinking it's this size project, so it's the size of the table for the same amount of money. And it's like, well, that isn't what we, no. that isn't what we spoke about. And it's you're right, there's two things. It's controlling... The controllables in as much as that's possible and if you've got the budget yeah we can go there not to actually it's got all the bells and whistles and you know elon musk's going to drop in and drop a little mm. bit of tech in there as well that's not i think it's it comes down to assumptions and un unsaid assumptions i mean that's where the biggest challenge can be or one of the biggest challenges around software is i assumed it would do x y and z you know you as a salesperson probably didn't say that it did but the picture in the client's head is, well, it will just do this. And, that, and that's that's the thing around communication. So for me, communication is a, a two-way thing. What I say and how what you interpret from what I've said is two different things, and it can be two different things. So I'm trying to be more and more now, it's actually spelling it out what it doesn't do. Mm. And, and, and a lot of the time being really yeah. clear on where, where it stops. Because, it won't do that. Because there's a perception, like you say, especially with things like accounts payable, people can just go buy the off the shelf one or download an app or mm -hmm. whatever, and you're gonna get whatever it does. You're not gonna be able to configure. You're gonna have to work within its constraints and things like that. We obviously configure the system how based on a framework, but again, like you say, it needs to be within a, within a remit. And again, we need to spell out it doesn't, do this, mm -hmm. but if you want it to do that, that's phase two, and mm -hmm. it needs to be clear. And, and I think you're right. The whole time in materials um, model of an estimate between this and this, but people know whether it be building a house, whether it be 
software is just the same. People, mm. the, once you get the emotions involved, you can think about it logically. But again, someone building an extension, actually, yeah, I want a different tiles. Well, they're more expensive. Oh, yeah, actually, can we move this? Or I want this here or that light moving there. All of a sudden, things mm. just, yeah. And then it's the same with, with the, oh, well, can I have that button over here? And well, hang on, we've, we've configured it over here. We have to rework all mm. this. Oh, actually, no, I want the workflow to go in this direction. Well, yeah, well, we've just spent mm. half a day building it how we originally thought. And again, but can you touch on the agile bit as opposed to waterfall? Because we have trans, like obviously moved across. Yeah. And I think the agile bit has actually caught a lot of those things a lot sooner in terms of iterations. and. Yeah, so waterfall, I guess, is about defining everything up front. So diff different stages of development from understanding the requirements then designing a solution based on all of those requirements, then building it against those requirements, and then testing it at the end, and then you go live. And it's all a big bang go live at the end. You know, Agile understands that with software, it's it's emergent. Things evolve and things emerge during the course of the build. And that's why with Agile, you advocate more of a, what we call an MVP, minimum viable product. So instead of specking all of your requirements up front and then designing against all those requirements and building them all, let's focus on what's the smallest, simplest thing that we can build that will allow you to get some value and give us some feedback on it. And then let's get that live. And then let's iterate from that point. And it's, it's based on trying to get the client as much value as early as possible and ultimately get them the right solution. Because if you, if you sit down with a client and say, I want to spec out everything that you possibly want, they'll get it wrong. Because they'll yep. put stuff in there they'll forget. that they don't actually need. We're human. And they'll yeah. pay for it. Yeah, yeah. And they'll they'll forget stuff that they, or not realise stuff that they actually need because they're, they're specking it on paper, which is really, really difficult. And until they use the system, oh, yeah, I didn't realise it did that. Oh, well, actually, now I've thought about it. If we press that button, that would save us loads more time and we'll yeah. change this. And But but the benefit, the benefits of that, you, you almost need to, you also need to accept the, the challenges of that, which is you're setting off on a journey acknowledging that you don't actually know where the end destination is and therefore there's some cost impl implications to that. Well, you say you don't know where the end destination is and, and I think I'm coming down on, on, on our side here. You can always stop. Yes. You can always yeah. get off at the stop before, you know, it, it, you know, at the point where your either your budget, your patience or whatever ends, you can stop. Yeah. Um, and I, for me, I do get the impression with the agile approach that I, I see all the benefits. I, I think customers struggle to see the benefits because they're kind of thinking it's an it's a it's an open checkbook. Um, going back in time for checkbooks, but mm. um, and also I think they get concerned around being tied up to a document. So where, and Steve always uses with me and you, Neil, the whole building analogy, well, you want a house, do you want a bungalow, do you want, you know, detached, semi detached what do you want? And, and within it, what do you want? And I, I find when I have conversations with prospective customers, I find that one of the things that they then start getting a bit itchy feet around is the fact that we need to put down in black and white what they actually want. And then it's kind of like, well, so we're going to deliver that, uh, yeah, okay. And and then it's like, well, no, actually, no, but I also meant I wanted this, 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 and this. And so, you know, when you speak to some of them, it's like, well, I, I want to have a bit more flexibility, which you can do on a time and material basis. But again, no one knows what stop the train's going to end at. And, and yeah, I mean, I've managed to do a couple of bits with current projects that are ongoing where a customer during the build have said actually can it do this and can it do that and we've had to sort of do a little bit of discovery and quantify it and then I've had to play it back and going well we could but that's three grand or that's two grand and then they've gone oh hang on that's not worth that change so yeah. we'll just stay as we are type thing and that's where that monetary value value versus yeah. return it's like okay we could do it technically it's possible it's going to cost this. Mm. Do you still think it. it's worth doing? I think with software, it's always the the Pareto principle of eighty percent of the value is often in twenty percent of the functionality. If you, I always go back to Excel as a product, you can do loads of stuff in Excel. Like 
You can run businesses on it. Mm. But actually, the vast majority of people use it to add, subtract, divide, no multiply. Comment. And, and they use, you know, more than 80% of people only use 10% of the functionality of Excel. So Agreed. if you were to rebuild that today, you wouldn't sit down and build everything it can possibly do because it would have taken Bill Gates a long time to build that. You'd scale it back and you'd say, let's just build the basics and let's get people using it. Mm. And then let's incrementally develop it over time, which is essentially what, what Bill Gates has done. Uh, but I always try to keep that in mind of let's focus on the basics and get them working first. Yeah. Agreed. All right. Are we there? So we've, what's so. the conclusion, just to finish on? We, we, let me give my view. I don't, we don't purposely mislead the customer in terms of what we do. Absolutely not. No. There's always ambiguity with software, and you don't often get into the detail of the requirements until later on. But I think you can mitigate that as much as possible by, by working as a team, by bringing technical expertise in early, um, and being honest, frank, open and transparent with customers about what we can and can't do and and having grown up conversations with them about the cost of doing that yeah completely uh, completely agree i do think there's a, a part two to this because i think it's when you're selling against someone who is selling the dream yeah that's Which, yeah and i was going to say that because if you're ethical and, and if you're if you're in it for the long term like me and john have been here a long time i'm nearly 10 years in so Again, it's not like I'm um, fly by night, sell the dream, get my commission, jump to jump ship, go to the next software company and mm. that type of thing. And maybe people should look at people's LinkedIn and just see how long he's been in the job because mm. if he's if he was ringing you up six months ago, flogging you a HR system and that person's coming now in to sell you a AP system or whatever, don't know. But yeah, for me, it, we do it from that, that standpoint. Where part of our job is to take a very complex Technology can be complex, but my job is to decipher that, put it in simple terms, make the customer understand, because they're the experts of their job. Mm. And if they're going to transition from a very paper process to a digital process, it can be scary. So it's a, we have to educate them. But you're right, we have to have that adult conversation. We have to lay out the boundaries, what, what is possible, what isn't possible, and obviously commercialize that and put a monetary amount around that. And then they take an educated decision whether it's worth that business investing in that technology or not. And then it's a then it's a relationship because it is a back and forward. It's co constantly evolving, constantly changing businesses, and we have to make sure that technology is supporting and enhancing that business. Yeah, and that's that's what we aim to do. Good summer. Thank you very much, guys. No problem.